Thank you very much, Anand. So before we start, actually, we would like to uh, share one thing with you before we start presenting. Um, so this is something that uh, will be used during the workshop. So I will share with you in the chat is an open spreadsheet. So you should be able to enter without problem. And there are basically two sheets in this work in this uh, spreadsheet. The first one is just for you, uh, for your task. So, so in this way, we know where we are and where you are. So if you have any problem, you can just uh, tell us what is your problem in which uh, uh, task you are, and then we can continue or um, try to solve your problem. So there are two requirements for the for the workshop, and I hope uh, everyone uh, has them. <laughs> and is to have a GitHub account. And the second thing is to have a token uh, from GitHub. So um, if you don't know how to do that, I will share a link in a moment, uh, or if someone can do that um, in the chat. And uh, yes, that, that's all. And the other thing I wanted to share with you is this. Uh, actually, we can start maybe if you can start uh, putting your name or GitHub account in the spreadsheet, so we can uh, speed up a bit uh, some of the steps. And please let me know if you don't have, uh, uh, or if, you, if you don't know how to create a GitHub token, I will share with you um, the link about it. Should be here and here. So, this is the link. Oh, thank you, Pep. Better <laughs> than me. Um, so I don't need to share it again. And so when you're ready, the first two thing we would like you to do is to uh, enter the tutorial repo, which is uh, this one in the chat. And then what we would like you to do is to basically, uh, the first thing is just to fork the repo. So once you have the GitHub account and the token, you can just fork the repo and then go to the URL of the repo. You can copy it. And we're going to, to use it uh, in the Meteor platform. So. You will know what is plat uh, Meteor in a moment after the presentation, but uh, to speed up the process, we are going to make it this uh, immediately. So this is the link to Meteor. So you can just enter the link. And what you have to do is just to copy the URL of your fork and then let uh, the magic happen. And Tom will explain also what happened in a moment. So if you have any problem, please uh, let us know. Or there's still something, uh, things that you uh, don't know how to do. Otherwise, we can start uh, with the presentation, I think. So please fill the uh, spreadsheet when you're ready. And uh, the second sheet, actually, just uh, to tell you right now, is with all the links and all the things that you will need in the workshop So to make the, the thing easy for you. We just put here what to, what you have to use. So here you have the tutorial repo, for example, and you have also the link to Meteor. The rest uh, will be will come in a moment when we will start the workshop. So thank you very much, and uh, I think we can start uh, with the presentation. So please go ahead, uh, Vasek. Let me know when I can move the slide. Yeah, you can move the slide um, right now. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about Open Data Hub, which is uh, the part of this whole workshop where you are going to be doing the AI. Um, obviously, it's on OpenShift. Uh, Francesco, if you can give me a next slide. I will first try to tell a story. Um, and sorry for the orange color. Uh, I couldn't change the color to the red to match the rest of the presentation. These are the slides I created before in a different template. Obviously, it's technology and always works, just not for me. Um, so I would like to tell you this story. So we, I guess most of us, uh, started our, um, 
IT, software engineering, data science, whatever journey you are on, uh, you started your journey and on your machine, you got a machine or you bought a machine, uh, it was, or it is sitting in front of you and it's great. You can do whatever you want with that. You can configure it the way you want. Um, and that's, that's how most of the people we talk about, uh, we talk to about doing AI and machine learning and data science these days, how they are working. They go to their IT um, and they, if we talk about like big companies, they talk, go to their IT and they say, I'm doing this data science project and I would like to uh, get a machine. It needs this amount of RAM, it needs this amount of uh, CPUs or, or CPU power. And uh, they get some machine and they work on that and then their data set grows, right? And it's bigger and bigger and they need more memory and more resources. And they also need to set up their machine. They need to install a new version of the software. They need to figure out what version works with which other version, things like that. And that's kind of where we, where we are now or where we were, um, let's say a couple months back maybe. Um, the other issues of that is that if you finish something, if you do something, you want to show it to others, and now it's sitting on your machine and you need to figure out how to share it, how to kind of move it to other people, how to how to deploy it somewhere else, right? Um, I've already mentioned that. You will ask for more memory, you will ask for more CPU, and it's not that easy. If it's a laptop, then there is not much to do, probably. If it's a if it's a workstation, maybe you can buy more memory, maybe you can buy a better CPU, but it's not gonna happen in minutes or, or hours. It's gonna be probably a week long process to get that done. And we are also getting into issues of works on my machine, right? We have all experienced that I'm developing something, I'm doing something, it works great. Then I give it to someone else to try it out. It just doesn't work because something is different, right? Francesco, if I can get the next slide. So, there is, there is a, another option for that, right? There is a second option and that's shared infrastructure. We've been seeing the move to the shared infrastructure for a long time for services. Nobody is now managing their own, well, not nobody, but a lot of people are not managing their own small server for a lot of things. They just go and buy a service or they go and buy a, a larger set of machines, some kind of cluster where they run everything there. And they share it with other people. Uh, so this is the same for, for data science and AI and ML, right? The benefits are kind of what I said before, but in the opposite way, right? It's much easier to collaborate. If it's already in the shared infrastructure, it, it should be much easier uh, to give it to Tom and get to give him access, access and say, hey, Tom, can you look at this? I think it works, but can you check some things on that? Um, there is much easier way to reallocate the resources if the resources are already in the infrastructure, well, great. A project A, which was popular last week, can be can, can be downsized and can take, get less memory. And a project B that is very important this week can get more memory or more more resources, more CPU, right? Or it can be based on demand. Depends on on what you need or what you want. And then also the works on my machine kind of goes away because if we are all on the shared infrastructure with very similar tools. Uh, we are using the same for tools for deployment, for development. Um, hopefully it's very similar to production, right? We are, we are trying to get to close to production approaches or production processes for development so that if we deploy the production or anywhere else than our machine, it's gonna work and, and, and we don't have to solve a ton of issues just because it's a different machine, right? Why am I talking about this? Um, we are talking about AI on OpenShift. OpenShift is kind of this picture, right? It's a shared infrastructure where a lot of people can come and, and can use the resources as they are assigned to them or as they are part of some groups, things like that. It's kind of normal now for developing or for, for doing web services and, 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 and I don't know, uh, APIs and databases and all these things, right? But it may be not that obvious for AI and machine learning. Uh, Francesco, next slide, please. And the reason, so the reason we are talking about this is that we were working or we have been working on open data project for last, I don't know, three years probably. Um, it started as a project internally at Red Hat. We needed something like that. 
for our needs at Red Hat because there is a lot of data produced every single day at Red Hat, but nobody was able to collect the data on, in, a, in a single place and nobody was able to process the data or there were no, tool, no tools, no like standardized approaches to how to process the data. So we started building open data. Uh, the core component of that is Jupyter Hub, which we will see or you will see uh, later. And um, what else it is? <clears throat> so we call it a blueprint because when people started to call it reference architecture, and the reference architecture often means to people something else than, than open data Hub is. So reference architecture of reference architecture often mean that it's something that is set in stone. That is how I should use things, how they should be tied together. Open data Hub is trying to be flexible and give you the flexibility of trying things your way rather than prescribing you how things should be done, but allowing you to do them in a default way, how they are configured in open data Hub or change them. So what is Open Data Hub? Open Data Hub is an AI as a service platform on top of OpenShift. It is an open source project. Um, so we have an open source community. Every, all the code lives on GitHub. Uh, we have uh, community meetings, uh, public mailing lists, all these things. It's also in a meta operator. So uh, probably not everyone is familiar with operators. Um, you might hear about that more during the workshop, but basically it is a way to encode some operational knowledge into software so that you don't have to do all the steps manually, but that the software takes care of the operations for you. So operator normally operates one single application that it understands well. Meta operator operates operators. So we deploy various operators uh, that deploy those end application and user applications like Jupyter Hub or Spark or whatever else. And also Open Data Hub is production ready. It is, a, uh, it is a system that is deployed as part of uh, Red Hat infrastructure. It is used by many Red Hatters. It's also now being used by Red Hat customers and some enthusiasts at universities and, and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if we dig a bit deeper into Open Data Hub, the idea is to cover the whole data science flow. So you need to be able to um, store your data. So we work with the Ceph project and with the teams around that. Then you need to be able to transform and process the data and create a model. So we have Jupyter Hub for that. That allows us to create Jupyter notebooks, uh, use various libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, PySpark, all these things, and uh, work with the data stored somewhere. Then we have, um, well, the Kubeflow box here. It's just thrown in there. Kubeflow is our upstream. We we use Kubeflow operator as the way to deploy things. We use the same structure for our deployment manifests and all these things. And you can also use components from Kubeflow in Open Data Hub. You can mix and match them pretty uh, pretty well. So if you look into Kubeflow, which is another AI ML project on Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift, you can look, uh, you can see a lot of interesting projects and useful projects. So you can use them as part of the workflow. And then you want to deploy your model. So we have pure OpenShift for that. You can just build a container and, and deploy your model. Or you can use things like Selden or KF Serving, where you have some automatically built APIs on top of that, metrics and all these things. Speaking about metrics, we also need to monitor what we deploy. And we need to review whether it still works or not. So we have Grafana and Prometheus as part of Open Data. And then also all this information, this new information needs to be stored somewhere. So we kind of tie this all thing back to the uh, storage to kind of a central central distributed storage, if that uh, term makes sense. And I've already said that uh, Open Data Hub is there to be able to use it as it is or, or extend it or modify it. So basically the idea is that you can just deploy it on OpenShoot by three or four clicks. You can start using it. If you find that something is not right for you, you can take it out, you can change the configuration, or you can even bring your own components by kind of following the approach that, that we have there. And I, I think Tom can talk about that more in the Operate First initiative because they are exact, doing exactly that. Um, next slide, please. I'm not sure if that's, there is more. Right, so this is very brief introduction to Open Data Hub. If you want to learn more, you can go to OpenDataHub.io. Um, we have community meetings on Mondays. And I'm not sure we changed it now, so maybe it's not regular every other Monday, but maybe it's kind of irregular. So what's the calendar, I guess. Uh, all the repositories 
are on the GitHub. As I said, we have plenty of presentations and demos recorded on the website. So if you go there, uh, go to docs, and there is a video and presentation section. And as I mentioned, there is documentation uh, and examples for how to use, how to try, what to try. I guess that's all from me now. Um, I'll stick around. If you have questions, paste questions into the chat, and I'll try to answer them, I guess. Thank you, Vajek. So we can move to the next part. Please, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I didn't have a chance before to introduce myself. I'm Tom uh, from, I am part of the ICOE Internet. Hub, and one of the initiatives that we work on is called Operate First. And Vashek already uh, kind of hinted what this, what this initiative is about. Uh, so let me maybe continue with the story time uh, that Vashik started. And uh, on the next slide, Francesco, please, thank you. Uh, we're going to jump into a different story, uh, into a story of operating uh, workloads. So we need a bit of uh, history. Uh, this is not a history lesson, right? This is a workshop, so I'm going to uh, keep it very brief. Uh, in the just a few years ago, uh, before we had things like open source uh, software, uh, the code was uh, what brought value to companies, what, what made up uh, companies uh, successful. The code was proprietary, and that was that was it. That was the world. Then on the next slide. Uh, something called open source uh, was brought to light. And uh, at that point, uh, we got, we got uh, software with, uh, with available source code to it. And uh, at the point, uh, it was very, it was just about uh, same important how you operate the code as uh, how you get hack on how you can hack on the code. So uh, now, uh, once you have access to the code, the source code, the differentiator, the actor uh, behind companies, how they differentiate, uh, what they do with certain software, is within uh, the operations within the section how you basically uh, handle the applications, how you deploy it, how you manage it. And at this point, uh, we're kind of seeing uh, a balance uh, at this point in history. On the next slide, um, this is where we are now. Uh, with cloud computing, uh, as uh, Vashe told you before, uh, we are seeing a bit of a shift from uh, local infrastructure to a shared infrastructure. And shared infrastructure is something uh, that is usually just consumed by, consumed by users. Uh, that's something uh, you don't usually have the experience to hack on, to uh, actually uh, try to operate yourself. And the operations itself became more valuable as, a, as an asset, as a knowledge uh, for companies, as an intellectual property, uh, than the actual application code itself. The op operations, as you can see in, in public cloud providers, are usually closed source, and, and you don't have uh, you don't have access to the knowledge these companies acquire in operating and managing the workloads that we all know. So imagine a software like Grafana uh, or um, as, or for example, storage, uh, software defined storage uh, and whatnot. Uh, you know that there's a project called this and that, and it's probably open source, so you can look up the source code of, of this particular project. But how you're going to deploy it and how you're going to scale it in a massive scale to handle loads of thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of users per uh, minute, hour. Uh, you don't know that. This knowledge is proprietary now. So on the next slide, uh, 
this is what operate first uh, would like to solve because we would like to level this out and balance open source code and operations by making operations open source as well. Uh, that brings uh, incorporation of operational experience into software development, uh, bringing developers closer to uh, SRE folks, to people who operate applications, who test the applications, and who uh, work on deployment and scaling of applications. So this is an idea, a concept that we're trying to implement and uh, we are basically trying to run uh, operations in open, uh, in open source way, uh, collaborating in open manner and uh, managing, uh, managing cloud infrastructure this way using the open principles. On the next slide, you can see a funnel graph of contributions, uh, like a scale from user to contributors. Uh, this is also a very important, very important aspect of uh, operating and basically illustrates where the problem with operating software is. Um, if you have an open source software, it's very easy uh, to um, figure out how to uh, how to solve a problem. Uh, the journey from I have this problem and here's the fix for it is pretty straightforward. It's possible for you to do that. Uh, but when you have a software as a service and there's a something, somebody, some entity uh, outside of you um, that manages the software, how do you know? How do you know how to contribute? How to fix your issues? How to deploy your fixes? Uh, it's not possible currently, and this is something we try to solve with Operate First. And we will be using Operate First infrastructure in this project. We will be working on a, a OpenShift cluster provided by Operate First, uh, and uh, everything uh, running on that cluster was was set up uh, using this uh, open open uh, idea of operations and operating stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So just to circle back to the operate first, um, this is trying to solve a problem uh, that we see in uh, open source code versus operations in a cloud uh, workspace, in a cloud world. Um, and uh, we have we have a full um, community going around this uh, initiative. And on the next slide, you can see a couple of links, how to, how to join us, how to contribute to this co uh, community. And uh, you will see if this approach actually works or not. We're trying to prove that it works. So uh, uh, we, will, we will be glad if you can join us there. There are also other talks on Operate First uh, during DEFCONF. Uh, so feel free to join those uh, as well. Uh, Marcel Hild will be talking about some interesting Operate First stuff there as well. So this was a short intro to Operate First and back over to you, Francesco. Thank you very much, Tom. So before we go ahead with Project TOS, I wanted to check if there are any questions for Vajek or Tom, um, or if you have any problems like with the first task I just gave you. Um, uh, I think there is one question in chat. Yes. Uh, uh, one of the users uh, were not able to start their VDR. Okay, Tom, I see Tom is helping them. We can, I think we can continue. Okay, then Tom can take care, I can go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. So let me uh, start. Uh, talking about uh, Project OS. Also, this will be a very short uh, introduction. So what is Project OS? Uh, you heard uh, uh, Vasek and Tom talking about uh, Operate First, uh, ODH, and one important concept that uh, was mentioned was uh, related to, if I want to share my code and I want to allow the others to rerun this code also without any issues, 
then uh, we need a way to basically give this code in the best way and uh, in a secure way. And this should allow reproducibility and shareability for, for everything that you do with your code. Either is Python code or is a Jupyter notebook. So everything you use, you should be able to just give him, give this piece of code to someone else. And if they have all the information uh, regarding uh, what uh, the dependencies, the runtime environment, and all this information, then they should be able to run it again without any issues. So Project Auth has uh, three main goals, I would say. Uh, the first of all, uh, the first one is uh, basically to help the developers in selecting the dependencies. So as you know, when you start working on your project, uh, one of the first thing is to select dependencies. So if I am a data scientist and I want to start my project in my notebook, I need uh, some dependencies. For example, I need the TensorFlow. But if I run pip install TensorFlow, this is something that uh, uh, work, of course. But uh, if I try to do to give this notebook to someone else and they try to run it again in one month, then uh, something might uh, not work because uh, maybe there is a new release of TensorFlow and this can basically break your notebook. Even if you state the specific version that you use for TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow itself does depends on other dependencies, which are called transitive dependencies. One of them, for example, is NumPy. If any of these versions change and uh, the, the main dependency is basically not uh, stating all of them in specific version, then you might have a problem because uh, on this machine will work, on the other one won't work. And what we want to do is to basically help developers in this task, so management of dependencies. And we want to actually give them uh, some uh, um, more degree of freedom. So if they want to choose uh, the dependencies, it's not just because I want the latest dependency, but maybe because I'm interested in performance. Maybe I'm interested in security. So I want a software stack which has no vulnerability, no CVE. I want performance because I need to train my model. So I want to know which version of TensorFlow is actually the one that is giving me the best performance, which does not mean it's just the TensorFlow one, but it's also all the dependencies that are behind TensorFlow. So NumPy have all the different versions, and each of them can impact also your uh, performances. So this is what uh, Project Toast tries to do. So there is a service which is using actually um, reinforcement learning and what we do is we learn about all the dependencies and we try to give recommendation to the developers based on their recommendation so if you are interested in uh, performance we will give you a software stack which is focused on that performance but i will go a little bit deeper in a moment so then the other two goals are more uh, related to the uh, images so one is that we want to deliver optimized images so as you can imagine if you have uh, some specific application for you know, computer vision or natural language processing, then there are different stacks. And all these stacks can also be optimized. Optimized not just for the software stack itself, but for all the layers that you have in the in in the code, basically also the interpreter. So we talk about uh, Python ecosystem. So you have the Python interpreter, you have the runtime environment uh, on top of it, so um, below it. So the operating system you're using and the CPU or GPU. So the hardware is also something that can affect. So TOT, actually takes into account all these uh, uh, inputs and it is able to provide you with a software stack that can run on specific runtime environments and can give you some specific requirements in terms of performance, security, or whatever is your interest in terms of the, uh, of the software stack. And the last uh, goal is basically that we want to automate all of this. So we don't want the developers to take care of dependencies. We want uh, bots to automate this. We want pipelines to create images for them. So we want them to focus just on, on the specific project and the problem itself. So they don't need to focus on about these things. So just a, a brief overview of the knowledge that we have. This is how we can provide this uh, recommendation. So we have build time and runtime environment uh, information. So we have a specific uh, uh, runtime environment that we use to install packages. So we learn if a, a package is able to be installed on a certain machine, if it's able to be run on a certain machine. We have, of course, all the dependencies. We run performances for specific stacks that uh, influence, uh, uh, for example, uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, all the one for uh, use for ML models. Um, we have also application binary interfaces, so to know if actually that code is going to run. Security, as I mentioned before, we have CVE. We have analyzers for vulnerabilities. 
And actually, we also take into account about uh, source code meta information. So when you use the open source project, uh, some communities are, let's say, well established and uh, the project is well maintained. There is uh, a history of this project and uh, there is uh, basically uh, a possibility that this process will, this project will go further. But some projects are not like this. So what we want to do with this uh, specific uh, meta information is to analyze open source project and gather information about uh, the level of maintenance, the level of security, if there is a community behind it, if they follow some specific policies. And these are information that we provide to the user. So they know that if I'm starting a project, maybe this is not the best uh, library to use for this uh, specific case. If I'm going to do this, uh, I don't know, to move this, co this code in production one day and then this project will basically disappear. So all this information are stored in the top knowledge graph. And the recommendation is something I already mentioned before. So there are different types of recommendation depending on your requirements. Regarding the integration, uh, of course, we want to integrate in most of the day-to-day -day developers tool. So we have a CLI uh, that you can easily uh, install with pip install and then do just Tamos advice on your software stack. Uh, we have Jupyter uh, um, lab requirements integration. So for data scientists that use uh, Jupyter lab or Jupyter tools, and this is what we will use uh, actually today during the workshop. We have integration for the GitHub repo. So there is bot that you can install from the GitHub marketplace and this bot will just pass by your repository and uh, can provide you with the updates on the dependencies. If there are any issue on your dependencies, they will be solved. Is there, if there is a new CVE that come up and uh, Todd learns about it, then it's gonna immediately open uh, a pull request for you to update the dependencies. We have also, of course, source to image. So if you are uh, familiar with the container uh, builders, then uh, Tot is also integrated in this kind of, uh, um, of tool. And this is important, for example, for pipelines. If you want to make sure, for example, that uh, no security uh, vulnerabilities are, are integrated into the code that goes in production, you can basically set uh, pipelines to build with the Tot uh, as a service and Tot will basically uh, fail if there is an issue from uh, in your dependencies that is related to security, if you're interested in that. And we have also, of course, pipelines, pipelines that optimize the builds and pipelines that allow you to reproduce all your code because uh, uh, thanks to Tot and the configuration that you can provide, we can state specifically what you want to use in your code. And this is just a summary of it. And if you're interested in Project Toth, uh, we have a YouTube channel. There is a GitHub uh, uh, repo where you can just go there, open issues if you're interested. Uh, there is a website, uh, Twitter, and on YouTube, you will find basically all the projects that we are working on. And also, if you want to know more into details, uh, what is the Toth service, how we provide the recommendation, there is a lot of material there. And with that, I close from Project Toth. So we can move to the last, uh, I think, two slides. It's not gonna be uh, long, I guess. So Tom, if you want to continue on Project Meteor, so then we can move to the workshop. Sure, um, next slide, please. So you've heard about uh, Project Off, about Operate First, about uh, Open Data Hub. We have quite a few data scientists in our um, broader team uh, and in our organization who are using all these uh, all these components, all these projects, all these initiatives. And we found out that we build as as, it, as it's usual in every other team, in every other organization, every other company. We've built a lot of tooling around those uh, around those applications, around those uh, frameworks. And at some point, we found out that we should uh, share this tooling. And don't get me wrong, the tooling was open source or still is open source, and all of it is accessible. And again, reiterating on the operate first principles, uh, we we made the code available to to you to be able to consume by you and deployed by you. But how do you interface with those applications? How do you use them? Uh, that was that was the uh, issue we found out that 
we are again uh, in the need to solve. And that broad project meteor to light, uh, it's a project that is trying to bundle all those tools uh, that we have uh, into a nice package that is easy to consume. And uh, prob probably you remember uh, from before, uh, as Bashir was, to uh, was talking about ODH, Open Data Hub, and operators. Um, so Project Meteor is trying to uh, package this uh, knowledge, this tooling, this uh, also operational knowledge about, about various data science uh, aspects of their workflow uh, into a nice package that can be also operationalized, operated, and automated. Uh, so Project Meteor uh, is uh, the user user interface for Project Meteor is the website that you've accessed uh, at, at the beginning of this workshop, and uh, it is it is trying to prove that we can uh, enable every user uh, on the internet or anywhere in the world uh, to use thought. Uh, thought uh, station projects, uh, all the thought advice and uh, Thanos and, and what other tools to Project Thought provides, uh, that we can also make it possible for you to use our uh, CI tooling that we have. And we are trying to prove and, and show you that you can uh, actually have something integrated with Open Data Hub and use uh, have a very simple and easy to use interface uh, how you can bring your own workloads into Data Hub. So, next slide, please. What we do in uh, Project Meteor is that we consume um, GitHub URL. Uh, this is a URL to any repository on GitHub. We initiate a couple of uh, pipelines, technical pipelines on top of it, uh, consuming this repository and basically building different artifacts out of it. Uh, some of them can be, uh, some of them can be Jupyter book websites that are being deployed as part of our infrastructure. So you will be presented with a Jupyter book website with statically rendered content of your repository and showcasing your data science findings uh, in a consumable way, in a consumable manner, so you can share your work with your colleagues and, and with your teammates, uh, and they can view uh, what kind of analysis you did. And if they are very interested in your analysis, uh, we have another pipeline that is uh, basically running uh, on top of the same repository, creating a different container image. But this container image this time is capable of being spawned in Jupyter Hub, which is a part, which is a component of Open Data Hub. So uh, this brings you an interactive form uh, how you can um, how you can interact with the notebooks in uh, any GitHub repository or shared infrastructure with uh, with depending on the cluster where we're running this at, but it can be right capable of or of the clusters can have plugged in GPUs, uh, huge memory pools and whatnot. So uh, right now, uh, this is a um, very easy way by passing a URL somewhere to get access to a shared infrastructure uh, with um, cloud computing capabilities uh, and uh, cloud computing scale, basically. Uh, and again, if you're passing this URL to Meteor, this image is uh, publicly consumable by any other Meteor user. So any other Meteor user can go and spin up this image in Jupyter Hub and interactively uh, work with uh, with the image, as we will see in the in the workshop um, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so that is the idea behind Project Meteor. We're still in very early stages of this project. Uh, we will be extending it with uh, other tools that we have uh, developed in AICOE or in, in Talk Station, or uh, anybody is basically welcome to integrate their tooling uh, into this cloud computing uh, user interface uh, for data science. Next slide, please. So, 
please feel free to visit us uh, at uh, at our repository file an issue uh, or uh, spark any any discussions you can also join us on uh, operate first slack and operate first community uh, it's it's all under uh, AICOE umbrella um, I think that's that's about it about meteor let's get to uh, showing things and actually doing a workshop uh, Francesco back to you Thank you, Tom. Um, so I hope you started to enter the link, uh, sorry, the URL into Meteor, as uh, Tom just described. And you will see that, uh, as he mentioned, there are two images that will be created. So we will have two links that will appear as like uh, available. Now I can open uh, basically my environment in Jupyter Hub, and I can also open uh, my my uh, web web page of the uh, GitHub, the Jupyter book that describes all the steps that we're going to follow, basically. So let me check uh, the status. So where we are, all of I see that uh, you're already ahead of me as well, which is also great. So, OK. So the first, first thing first, if you are already here, I see that some are not ready yet um, but in any case if um, your image is basically not ready you can just go to the main page and as tom mentioned all these uh, images are actually available on jupyter hub but you can reach all of them here so you can just pick up any of the image that are already finished if you want and we can go ahead uh, like that so you can use for example uh, this is, for example, mine. Uh, if you want to use it, it's OK. So in this way, we are all on the same page. And we can say that we can go ahead from here. So once you are here, you can open the Jupyter book if you want to have a look. So this is something that we will follow now during the workshop. So there is everything explained about the steps that we're going to follow. Um, the spreadsheet is more to have uh, an overview of what you are doing so we know if you're going too fast or you need some help or anything. And uh, I think uh, Anand already mentioned, so if you have any issues, you can also uh, talk, not just uh, write. So feel free to interact with us uh, as much as you want. And we are here also to answer any question uh, if you have a question about uh, anything that was uh, presented today. The other link is uh, the Jupyter environment. So as you saw, some of the next steps or task for you is to basically open uh, this environment and to select the large size for the for the resources. So um, actually, as you can see, like I have the name of my ID. So it's Meteor BR5RG. So I should be able to find it in this list of images um yeah i might be able to find it yes here it is so then i just select uh, large and then i can start my server so now is jupyter hub task to spawn my image that was created by meteor and i can update login in operate first and you already are here and I'm starting the image. It should be ready in a moment. So meanwhile, I can start maybe talking a bit about the tutorial that we're gonna see today. So the purpose of this tutorial is actually to show uh, most of these uh, tools that were described uh, that are available in Open Data Hub and uh, is gonna describe in particular the two interface, the interface actually between the data science and the DevOps. And thanks to Operate First and the open way to see, you can also see what is happening and you can check everything. So the data scientists can see what DevOps is doing and vice versa. So they can also uh, share and learn from each other as we do in a community and uh, in an open uh, environment. 
And uh, the application that we're going to do today is a simple application. It's just a um, classification. I think everyone knows about it. Uh, what we will focus is more about uh, how the, the tools and the way we can develop basically AI project using uh, Operate First, uh, Open Data Hub, and all the tooling that is on top of it. And um, so the first thing is just uh, environment description. So if you want to know what we use, what we're going to use is uh, Open Data Hub, of course, on top of OpenShift, which is running on Operate First. We use a cloud storage object. In this case, we use a Minio. Uh, the Tecton pipelines are the one that actually were used uh, also in the AI CCI, so the one that is building your images. And uh, Argo CD is something that we will talk a little bit uh, later. Maybe Tom can also mention uh, something more because he's uh, more expert and about uh, uh, Argo CD. And uh, the tooling itself, so Jupyter Hub for spawning the images, Elira, for those of you that don't know, so Elira is uh, basically uh, an extension for Jupyter Lab that allows you to create uh, AI pipelines that can run on top of different engines. So you can have uh, Airflow or you can have uh, Kubeflow pipelines. And Kubeflow pipeline can run on different uh, um, tooling like uh, Tecton or Argo. But we will see this in a moment. Then we will use Project Auth. Uh, the extension that uh, I showed uh, before is the one we are going to use today is the one for the Jupyter Notebooks. And Kubeflow pipeline to basically run these pipelines through Elira. Uh, the concept that uh, also we want to always uh, share is that uh, we want to allow everyone to reproduce their the work. So if I today develop some project and I want the other to share, to reuse it and to repeat this experiment, then they should have the project with all the pieces that are required in order to rerun the same experiment. So in this way, they cannot encounter any issues and they can uh, repeat and share and uh, show this example to someone else. Um, automation, as I mentioned before, we're going to use uh, bots and pipelines to do most of the work. Some of the steps that we're going to see is something that I will show you. We're not going to repeat it uh, because uh, probably we don't have time, but uh, you're going to see how actually we work usually in the ICOE. And uh, also these tools, of course, are available. If you want to install them, I will uh, show you how to do that if you want to reuse them. And uh, we can start, I think, with the prerequisite, I, th I hope. Or, I mean, yes, everyone was logged in, so you have a GitHub account. Remember, you need a GitHub token because uh, we need to push the changes uh, that we're going to make in your projects that you're going to fork, um, that you have in uh, uh, Jupyter Hub, and then you need to push to, to your fork. Uh, OpenShift uh, and everything is already set because uh, Meteor already set everything for you in terms of uh, resources, in terms of uh, what you need, the environment, the images that we're going to use have been already created, uh, and the dependencies for your uh, specific uh, actually image has been already set because of Meteor. And so we can move um, to the first part. So the first part is something that we already did. So if you actually don't use Meteor, you have some steps that you need to follow to go to Jupyter Hub and select images and go ahead. In this case, we use Meteor that is automating uh, everything for us and creates already the image. So we don't need to uh, do anything else. One thing that I want to share with you is uh, the importance to have some common structure for your project. So in uh, AISOE, we follow a structure that uh, was created uh, by one of our teams, the AI Ops team. And actually, this kind of structure is the one that we reuse um, in any data science project we have. In this way, we are able to uh, find immediately what the others are working on. If we look for something specific about the project, we can immediately find it. So if I want the notebooks, I know where to find them. If I want the manifest, I know where to find them, the models, if they're here or they're linked to uh, some specific location. But in this way, we can allow everyone to see how the project is structured, what you are doing. And this is very easy for anyone else just to pick up uh, that project and. Uh, learn about it and exp and repeat the same experiment. As you see, there are dependencies. There is everything that is required for a specific uh, project to be shared. And this is already something that we already did. So the first thing we're going to do, if the image is ready, I hope everyone is uh, on the same page. 
Um, let me know if you're already in the JupyterLab image. Remember that uh, if your uh, Meteor pipeline is not finished, you can always pick up uh, any of the other that are already uh, created. So we can move ahead because in any case, we're using all the same uh, um, environments in this case. So the first thing you are going to do actually is to clone the repo. So as it described, um, Jupyter, when you install, when you have uh, Elira, Elira comes with a set of extension for JupyterLab. And one of, one of these extension is uh, the Git extension. I guess everyone, or I hope everyone is familiar with Git. And uh, this extension is basically going to facilitate all the things directly because you can do it uh, with this extension. So you have uh, a Git clone. And what you can do, so we are everyone can go to their own fork, go to code, and they can clone their own repo. So you just take your link from your own uh, uh, fork and insert it here and just hit clone. After a few seconds, uh, the extension will just clone the repo. As you see, you have two, but the one we just clone is uh, this one. So you should have, all of you should have this kind of, this uh, repo in the Jupyter. And if you see, it's actually all the structure that you have in, uh, in uh, this fork. So let me update it. I also clone it. Someone has an issue because I don't see that all of you are in that step. Please uh, let, us know, let us know in the chat. Or hi, Johnny. Um, so let me see. Let me know also if you are stuck in any of the uh, issue. Uh, sorry, in any of the task. And remember that uh, if you have, uh, or if you don't remember any of the links, here you can immediately find them. So in this way, we don't lose track, but uh, we will go and use each of these uh, in a moment. So if all of you clone the repo, kind of, I see half of you copy, uh, clone the repo. Is any of you having issue talking to these uh, users? Francesco, can you show the Jupyter Hub uh, spawn red UI and uh, basically the meteor selection? Uh, yes, I guess I can yes. go here. Um, or you would need to shut down your server so I can probably. Oh, share yes, please. It. Can you? Should I stop? Go ahead. <laughs> I also have a running server, but I'm stopping it right now. Okay. So, uh, uh, so the problem is, uh, it is blank. blank. So I'm going to do the full flow now. I'm going to log out. So when you go to this uh, URL, Jupyter Hub URL, you're presented with this screen. You can click on the operate first, which will log in through GitHub. Um, it's just an authentication to the OpenShift cluster, nothing else, basically forwarding you your uh, GitHub username uh, to uh, operate first. And you should be presented, okay, it's blank for me as well. <laughs> uh, let me take a look at at what may have come wrong. Uh, 
Uh, hey Tom, can you try clearing your cookies and refreshing the web page and let's see if that works? Uh, clear your cookies. Okay. Nope. Tom, can you show me the uh, the um, web console, the developer web console? <laughs> and go to console. Is there any error? Mix content unable to fetch UI config. Yeah, we have seen this error in the past, but it's basically impossible to reproduce and it just happens completely randomly and but it haven't happened to us for a long long time <laughs> um the problem okay. is that basically the only way we figured out to fix it is to dump the uh jupyter update database mm -hmm. because this it seems that the issue is that the jupyter hub stores some uh, either a cookie sessions or something in the database. And for whatever reason, when it tries to kind of re-log in with, for the, for the service, um, it just, it just can't. And then there is some redirects and it ends up being this. Um, Okay, so should we uh, I think the like the so the hundred percent sure way how to fix this is to for a, an admin go to OpenShift console or I mean through the U, through the CLI, whatever, and basically scale down Jupyter Hub, scale down the database or and and, and recreate the database pvc and scale it up all again or i mean if you know from the top of your head how to uh basically delete the database of postgres um and let jupyter have recreate it that works too um, for me it was always faster to just delete the pvc um mm -hmm. it should still like that. it should allow everyone to basically jump back to where you were you shouldn't lose the running pods and anything it's just uh, kind of the user information stored in the database uh for whatever reason sometimes very rarely gets stale and uh and this happens and since we can't we don't know how to reproduce it it's very hard to fix we had like three various fixes in open data that all seemed to fix it because after the fix, we couldn't reproduce it anymore. <laughs> Although we had 100% sure reproducer, but then a couple days later, it showed up again. Now you have it on video. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's nice to see a live uh, session of debugging. And um, to we start that. in the pods now. Uh, so it should be back up again soon. We we, so we, we, joked, all... we joked we joked around that like are you ready? We are not ready. Well, I mean we are kind of ready, but we were not ready for this. It's okay. It take a few minutes in any case. So we should all log in again in uh, from Meteor or from Jupiter Hub directly, right?
Yeah, once the once Jupiter Hub is back up, you can just yes. you can just go just reload the page, and and you should basically be where you were. It shouldn't hopefully kill any pods. It should just pick them up, pick them back up, and if you're if you have uh, environment running, it should be should get back there Perfect. very quickly. So now I'm waiting for the ODH operator to reconcile the PVC. And then we should be back up. OK, thank you. That's why you take with you two experts doing the workshop. I can you show you what I'm doing. It's maybe more exciting than watching the blank screen. Yeah, we did not talk about OpenShift, so if you want to show something meanwhile. So right now I'm uh, skimming through. Because you will get access to it in a moment also. OK. Since everything was reconciled here, so let's take a look at the Jupyter Hub. Okay, we don't have the PVC yet. Uh, we can just create the PVC manually. We don't need to wait for the operator to. Let me go to the Jupyter Hub and create the few commands. So the database is creating now. It's able to attach the PVC that we've recreated right now. And it should be starting any moment now. OK. Now Jupyter Hub should pick it up. This book time out, I'm gonna speed it up. Great, so Jupiter Hub is starting. We should get a new Now it's up. So now I would like to see if users can see the same <laughs> or if I fixed it just for myself. Uh, it seems to be working fine for me now. Francesco, you're muted. I'm sorry. I said, yeah. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Vasek. <laughs> I think we can go ahead if everyone is able to spawn. Uh, so, just select your meter. So now you basically want to uh, search for this string on this page to find your meteor and large. select the large size and hit start server. And this will bring you up to a Jupyter Blob environment using this. Uh, using this image. Great. So, this meteor image right here. And if you already forked 
or clone the repo should be already there, right? Mm, the repository folder? The one we just uh, clone because I see it. So it should be there for everyone if they already cloned it. If they cloned it in the Jupyter Hub environment, they can see it. But if they did not, they will need to clone it again. Did you do it? Lead me, please. OK, you have it, seems. What should I do now? Um, now I should proceed. Can I share again? Okay. So now should I be Bitcoin and uh, No, no, we use the, yeah. We actually use the GitLab extension. So. Yes. I guess you have it maybe or not. Doesn't matter. I want a new one. Yeah, well, maybe conflict if it's the na same name. But it okay. Wasn't. Great. Right, so Thank you. Thank you, I'm Tom. Handing the screen share back to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Vajek. So hopefully we are all on the same page now. I hope so. I will check here. Everyone was able to clone the repo. You should have like uh, one repo called uh, Elira AI DevSecOps tutorial without any date. So just be sure that you have this repo. And remember, you can clone it. You just need to go to your fork, copy this link, and you can uh, enter it in the it JupyterLab extension. I see a few of you still did not have, not clone it. Am I correct? I think most of the folks are still spawning Jupyter Hub images. Okay. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six new uh, Jupyter Hub servers. So if anyone has any problems, please let us know. Otherwise, we can do the next step. We should have still all the time. So when we basically finish this step, meanwhile, we can go ahead and start to talk about the next one. So the next one is basically what you do typically in your project is to start creating your notebooks. So the notebooks uh, for this specific tutorial have been already created. And if you open basically the repo that uh, it was cloned, as I said, because of the structure that we use for all the projects, it's very easy to find the content that we want. In this case, we want the notebooks. We know where to find them. And in particular, we're gonna use uh, two notebooks for this first part of the tutorial, which is more, uh, let's say, focus on the machine learning model development. So these are two typical steps, very easy in this case, to just do download the data set and train the model. So it's some NIST classification as we mentioned before. So if you go to the download data set notebook, you will see that there are simple steps. Um, it's basically importing the libraries, loading the data and storing this uh, on Minio. As you can see, first of all, there is no cell that mentioned PIP. So we don't want anything like that to be present in the notebooks because uh, that is not something that you can reproduce. So that is why we created the Jupyter Lab requirements extension. 
And this is actually a very important point for us because we want to allow the others, as I mentioned before, we don't want them to use uh, um, pip install in the cells because it's not uh, safe. It's not also uh, safe to share these notebooks that have pip installed because they cannot reproduce them. So we created this uh, extension. And this extension, actually, what it does, it takes into account about uh, the requirements. So if you have any requirements for, for your uh, specific uh, software stack, so if I want TensorFlow, for example, Matplotlib, Boto3, these are some very common uh, uh, libraries that you use in your machine learning projects. We also store actually the pip file lock. So all the things I mentioned before, you have always the direct dependencies, which is TensorFlow, Boto3, and um, Matplotlib, for example, but then you have all the transitive dependencies. So all the one that comes with the with these uh, packages and uh, these are important because uh, a change in each of them can basically break your code. And with each of the version that are stated, actually locked in that uh, pip file lock, and you also find the ashes. So if you want to know where this specific package came from, which is of course uh, important for security. And uh, in each of them, you also know which kind of resolution engine was used. You can use a uh, TOT or pipenv at the moment. So we, we support, of course, both of them. And uh, we have also a configuration file that mentioned the runtime environment that you use. So in this way, we know that uh, your notebook has been created uh, on Fedora or RHEL or UBI or Ubuntu or whatever kind of uh, operating system you're using, in which version, and the Python interpreter you were using. And how do we see this? So of course, this notebook has been already created uh, with this in mind. And the extension is present in all the images that are created uh, through Meteor and are available on uh, JupyterHub. There are three ways to interact with this, in, with this uh, specific extension. So the first one actually is the more common, uh, most common, is the one uh, that allows you to work directly in the notebook cells. So we're going to see in a moment what you can do with that. The second one, if you want to integrate this in, I don't know, pipelines for specific uh, steps, or you want to check dependencies, or if your notebook has dependencies, then you can use, for example, the CLI. And then you have also available the uh, UI, of course, if it's something that uh, you prefer, or if you want just to work on the notebook cells. But, so if you want to have a look or try, basically, this is the UI. So the UI shows the, actually the library that I wanted to have. And uh, as you can see, there is TensorFlow, Boto3, and Matplotlib. And in this case, this is what you state, so what you would do with PIP. For example, in the cell, is not something that you want to do because you cannot save this information. But here, when the dependency management lock, actually the dependencies, we store everything in the notebook. And you can see this in a not uh, maybe friendly way here, because uh, in the notebook metadata, you will find all the information related to the dependency resolution engine that was used and the requirements that were used, the one that I just showed a few seconds ago. But there is also all the requirements lock. So in this way, any other developer or any other data scientist that want to try this notebook knows exactly what needs to be used and which dependency needs to be installed. And another easier way, if you want to try, is just to do Horus check, which is the magic commands for the JupyterLab requirements library. Horus check just uh, verify that your notebook uh, basically has everything that uh, is needed for from the dependency point of view. So that you have a dependency resolution engine that was used, the requirements, the requirement lock, that the pip file and pip file lock are also corresponding because they have an hash that is uh, basically matched in order to have the correct one. And also if there are, if the kernel you're using is something that uh, is already present. If you want to see in a more uh, friendly way, maybe the content, you can find, for example, the pip file, you can use auto show. So you can see the pip file that was, um, uh, it's basically the note, the metadata that are shorter are saved in the notebook metadata or the pip file lock. And you can see exactly what is stored in this notebook. So in this way, basically the notebooks can be shared safely with others. And any of you can reuse the same notebook that I have and uh, run them without uh, any problem. Uh, hey, Francesco, I see uh, Karan has a question. 
Yeah, just yes. a quick question. Uh, how do I set my uh, resolution engine to uh, Thought using Horus? And what benefit do I get if I use Thought engine over uh, a regular pip end? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Karen. Um, so if you want to use uh, the, so if you use the UI, um, there are two options. So when you, from the UI actually, when you install, the install button, uh, consider both the resolution engine. So first tries for Thought, and if Thought has uh, some issues in um, for the locking these dependencies, it can fall back to uh, pipenv. While if you go actually from the Horus magic commands, there is uh, Horus uh, uh, lock, and Horus lock basically does the same thing, but uh, by default use uh, Thought services to uh, create the software stack for you. And you have all the option related to uh, the runtime environment. So if you want to use a specific, uh, if you want to receive a recommendation from a specific uh, operating system or Python interpreter, so this is something that you can do. While pipem will just uh, be uh, a simple or slog dash dash pipem, and it's going to use pipem by default. And when everything is uh, created by pipem or tot, it's going to be stored into the uh, software stack. The advantage of tot of course is that it knows about the runtime environment so thought itself can discover where your notebook is running so it's able to identify if your notebook uh, is um, running on a certain operating system what kind of hardware is uh, used and this information are stored only when uh, thought is used in that case because thought can basically give you the recommendation specific for the runtime environment that is not something that you can do with pipen so Thought can uh, specifically say, this is the package you should use in this operating system because uh, we already tested it. The knowledge graph of Thought already has this knowledge. So it knows that you cannot run a specific version of TensorFlow on uh, Ubuntu, on uh, UBI, on Fedora. So we already analyze all of this knowledge and Thought has it and can basically share with the, all the developers that use this service. Gotcha. So it basically gives me the optimal set of uh, dependencies. Yes. Basically optimize the software stack for your runtime environment. And if you are interested in specific uh, requirements like performance or security, then the software stack will be slightly different because of uh, um, some specific uh, information that are stored in the knowledge. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Your, uh, thank you for the question. So this is basically how we created these notebooks. In this case, we don't need to recreate the dependencies because the notebook had been already created with this in mind. So for the tutorial is some a good example of this. When we started working on this tutorial, um, me and my colleagues were starting to work on these notebooks and uh, we already created the dependency for the notebooks. So we know that uh, this is what has to be used for this notebook. And in particular, with the use of Meteor, Meteor is able to identify these uh, environments and can basically automatically create them. So in this case, the notebook can simply run because the environment has been already uh, is, is already using the optimized uh, software stack that was provided and it was installed directly by Meteor. So let's leave the notebooks uh, clean and I will uh, tell you later why. So if you want just to try these commands, you can, but uh, please leave the notebook uh, as they are for now. Uh, the other notebook is the training one. So these are the two notebooks that we're gonna use. So this notebook is basically going to retrieve the data set that was uh, downloaded and uh, is gonna train the model. So here we set the parameters, we divide the uh, data set into train and test. We create the convolutional neural network and basically we train it. And once everything is done, uh, we store it on the on on uh, the cloud storage. In this case, Minio. So let's go back to the uh, part. So I think we were just following this section. Um, the next steps is how do we push changes on? Like we are in this uh, environment, and I want to share back. So when we, this is typically important when you work uh, on project with other uh people in the team so if you're working on the same project and you want to share what we do of course is push the changes in uh, on github so that everyone has always the most updated version of the project and we can keep working just uh, recreating these environments which have the latest versions and everyone will be basically up to date with this 
Um, let me check where we are at the moment. So we can consider this step. I mean, there was not mentioned, it's more for you to understand the concept and the, why we want this to be uh, present in every project and why we want uh, everyone to start using this kind of uh, uh, tools because these are important for reproducibility and uh, especially when we work on uh, open source and we want to share this project, then we need to allow the others to repeat these experiments. So if everyone is uh, happy or has no question, more question about the dependencies, we can move to the push change part. And this is where actually you will need your token. So let me go back to the book. So we can always follow, as you see, Meteor gives you these two environments. It is very easy to uh, move between them and you can always see, follow the, the tutorial and uh, at the same time apply what you're learning in the tutorial. Um, so there are two ways to push changes. Um, the JupyterLab Git extension is the one we are using at the moment. So if we go actually here, uh, you can go to this tab, Git, and you can see actually what happened. So the notebook have been uh, modified because uh, uh, the date time and some, some uh, um, initial configuration from Jupyter is changed. We didn't change the content itself, but of course, there are some different in terms of the uh, timestamps and the moment we were like opening them. So because this information are automatically saved, so they uh, appear as modified. And uh, with this extension is very easy just to push uh, the changes. So imagine that I want to push my two notebooks or just one of them. I can go to the plus button. There is a stage this change, which is basically what happened when you do git add a specific file and when they are staged then you want to commit them so you want to actually um, commit these uh, specific changes and you just need to basically say something uh, re regarding this change so in this case update for example download data set this is my commit i modified a specific notebook and now i want to contribute back to the to my fork, and uh, if I'm happy, I can open up a request in the main project. So what you do is just commit. Um, this is something that is requested the first time you basically use the Git extension. This is also, if you use the Git on your machine, the first time you need to state uh, the name and the email. So this is something personal for you. Um, I don't mind sharing. So in this case, I put just my name and my email that are linked to the git uh, account that i created and as you see once this is done the commit has been created but now it is not uh, still pushed uh, so what you have to do to push is just to click this one so if you see there is uh, there are changes that needs to be pushed you can just click here and now you can basically open and say this is um, your credentials and maybe i don't want to share the token with everyone in this case but please set your token there i will add it in a second so you don't have to see all the tokens let me share again So you see, I have my my username of my GitHub account and my token is already there. I hope everyone was able to create it and uh, they can use it now. So you just do okay. And then it's pushing the changes. And now if we go back to our uh, repo, we should see like, as you see the commits uh, were changed because there were some um changes that have been pushed to your fork and now you can basically contribute if you want to the main repository and if you go here you will see that there are changes that i just made uh, related to the to the notebook and this is basically how we do uh, or how we share our work and how we contribute back to the main project and as you see this is all very easy and automated using these tools um we can keep working on your note. You can keep working on your notebooks, modify things. You just move them to stage, and you you just go 
through the UI and you can do everything about this. There is another way to push because actually there is a limitation for this extension, um, which is that can handle only one repository at the time. And later I will show you how to do this directly from the terminal of JupyterLab because you have also the possibility to open a terminal and do uh, things. So you have one environment for doing everything. But we will see it later when uh, we need to deploy the model uh, um, that we're going to create. So now there is next step. I will say that this is part can be considered done. So you know how to push. I hope everyone was able to push. If you had any issue with the token or um, username, email, please let us know. Um, OK, thank you, Rashi. So if anyone has other question, please let us know. Otherwise, I think we can move to this very quickly. We don't go through these steps because, it's, as I said, we don't have the time to go through all of it. But I will show you very quickly how you can do and enable uh, the pipelines for you to work. And we will trigger one so you will see what happened uh, when, uh, when this happened. So let me go back here. So we already talked about some of this uh, in the presentation. We have some tooling, and uh, we use this tool to automate uh, continuous uh, integration, continuous the delivery of images. And uh, this is done through the ICUCI. So there are different checks that are run, and the ICUCI is also able to uh, push, uh, sorry, to create the images and push them to the registries. How does it work? Uh, the the ICUCI can be installed easily from the GitHub Marketplace. So you have the AICCI, you can go and just install it on your repo. And uh, what you need to configure in your repo in order to run it is uh, just one configuration file. So if we go back to the repo itself, you will see that there is one configuration file called AICCI. In the AICCI, you can basically state the um, type of images that you want to create. And in this case, for example, we created one image for the download dataset notebook. We have one image that is optimized for the training one. And now you see the importance of having a specific uh, software stack built for the notebooks, because if you want to uh, basically create, use these notebooks in uh, uh, pipelines, for example, you can create images that are optimized for the notebook. You can imagine that, for example, the download data set uh, requires maybe latest uh, recommendation. So you can use that and optimize. But the training one might require, I don't know, performance. So you want uh, to train your model using a GPU, or you want some specific uh, um, version that is optimized for that. Then uh, thanks to the services that uh, Todd can provide, for example, you can do this. And if we integrate those services with the ICI, then you have an automated tool that can create images for you. So as you can see, what the AI ACI expects is just a, a base image that you want to use for that specific uh, image to create, the type of uh, uh, build strategy to use, and then the registry when we want to push. So this is, we use QA for uh, the registry where we stored all these images. And this is something that uh, uh, is the only thing required from the AI ACI point of view. And of course, you can use your own registry. This is uh, something we use. But uh, if you go here, you will find more information about uh, actually how to create your um, secrets, how you can um, add them to the ICI, ISO ACI, and how you can use the, um, the release pipelines. The second thing you need. Actually, if you want to integrate, as you follow the presentation before, we want to automate this. So we don't want to take care of it. We want the bots to do this for you. So what we do, we have uh, another bot on GitHub Marketplace, which is called Kaboot. So Kaboot is the GitHub Hub integration and interface to the actual Kebeshet bot, which is the thought uh, integration for uh, um, the GitHub application. So it's basically taking some uh, all this information that are stored in the in your repo, and what it can do, it can actually make release for you. So you can simply open an issue, 
And this is what we are going to do in a moment. So you will see how it behaves. I hope uh, everything is running on the background already. But basically, I modified something in the project this morning. I, I changed just one image because I want uh, to be rebuilt in one of the steps of the pipeline. And what I do is just uh, opening any of these uh, patch release, minor release, and major release. So let's imagine that I want a patch release. I can just submit the issue. You see that uh, one of the bots is already assigned to this issue. And when what happens on the background is that uh, the GitHub app is taking basically uh, this event. And it knows that uh, this repo has uh, some specific configuration, which is the, uh, the one for TOT in this case. So TOT uses the same, uh, sorry, the same, is the is also as a, a configuration file. And this configuration file states the same uh, name for the specific uh, steps that they're going to use because they are in a way connected. This is the software stack optimized for this uh, step. And this is the optimized image basically that is created from this software stack. And as you see, there is also the download data set and the training data set. And here you can state the operating system that was used to create uh, that specific uh, software stack and the recommendation you want. As you see, we want latest, for example, and training, we want the performance one. And all the process is completely automated for us. So as soon as we open this issue, the bot will uh, take care, look at this configuration, and uh, it will start to uh, create the image. As you see, it's already done. So it opened a pull request for us and uh, say, OK, this is the change log. This is what has been changed in the last, uh, uh, well, I made more than one change in the last few days. So now I'm uh, uh, making a release, and the bots is doing this for us. So when this is automatically merged, actually, the bots will take over and merge this automatically. Just to speed up the process, we can manually merge it. And when this is going to be merged, is the bot will basically create a tag on this uh, repo. The tag will be version 0.12.1. And we should see it here, I hope. Otherwise, we can manually create it. And what will happen is that actually it was created. As you can see, there is, this is a Tecton, the Tecton UI. And uh, here, the ICO ACI is the one that is uh, doing all the work for us. So the tag is the tag release that I just opened. So the pipeline itself, what it's doing is just uh, checking what is happening, all the uh, requirements that are in the repo. If there is a type of uh, overlay build. So overlay build is when you have more than one software stack to be used in, uh, in your project. And uh, what it does, now it will start building all the images for all the um, different software stack. And it appears there is some issue, or but we can check later. This is basically how um, all the pipeline take over. And actually, no, it, it worked. It already started, as you see, the different images. So there is one for download data set, for the experiment, inference, and training, which is exactly what we saw in this uh, configuration file. So there are four images that are going to be built. And this is the overlay strategy that we use. And uh, as you see, I didn't do anything. What I do during my daily is just uh, having a look at the project, modifying, creating notebooks. But then the rest is completely automated. Uh, once I push, then the bots can take over. They will maintain my dependency. They will create the release for us. And I don't know if you have any question related to this, to this part, but uh, this is the one that we are skipped today because uh, requires a little bit of uh, um, well installation, but that you need to modify or you need to have your own registry for these kind of things. So we just uh, uh, created the images for you. And now we move to the part that we create the AI pipeline. So if you have any question, please uh, let me know. Otherwise, we can move to the more interactive part. And you're going to use Elira, and you're going to create uh, uh, AI pipelines, and then we're going to deploy the model um, in the cluster. And you're going to also see what happened in OpenShift. So if there are no questions, then I will go ahead. I hope 
everything is clear and uh, you get um, all these concepts that are important uh, for working in uh, like uh, or working in a project that is uh, um, not just one project that you work by yourself but this is something that you work with many other people so this is important to have an infrastructure and uh, automated task that can uh, release some of your work and you can focus on specific uh, things and you allow the others basically to reproduce your work to add feature on top of it uh, or to modify things this is something that we can as you can see with all the tooling that is available on uh, openshift and open data hub this is uh, quite easy to do so if everyone is uh, uh, good i would go ahead and just uh, start with the i pipeline so Let's see what is Elira and what we want to do. So Elira is, uh, as I said, the Jupyter Lab extension that allows you to create uh, pipelines. And these pipelines can be run uh, on Kubeflow pipeline, which is backed by Argo Tecton usually. But in this case, we use uh, Tecton. And how do we create pipelines in the Elira? It's quite easy. So once you have your notebooks and they are ready, then if you want to create, uh, we have the pipeline already here because the tutorial is already uh, created. But if you want to try, what you do is usually opening a pipeline editor. Let's uh, rename it as you want. Uh, DevConf US 2021. And what you can put in this pipeline is uh, steps. So you can put several steps, which can be not only notebooks, but can be also Python code. So if you want to insert Python code, you can. If you want to insert notebooks, you can. And you can also link these notebooks. So in this case, we don't require this uh, specific step, but just to show you that you can do, and it's very flexible, you can basically say, OK, I want to download the data set, which is the first notebook I created, and I want to retrain the model. So as you can see, this allows you to have pipelines that you can rerun. As you know, the, um, the application lifecycle is not static. So every time you create an application, there will be uh, maintenance to be done. There will be new, I don't know, vulnerabilities in the software stack that requires new changes. Or if you have some specific machine learning model, there is the data drift concept. So in that case, you need to retrain the model with new data. So this kind of pipelines basically allows you to automate all of this because you can uh, create some specific task just to um, automate that. And then this pipeline can rerun every, uh, every time you want or every time you set the trigger to rerun this pipeline. So this is the easy way to create the, the, um, the pipeline. What is important now is, as I mentioned before, for each of the notebook, we create optimized stacks. And why, we, why did we do that? Because we want to use uh, images specific for that. How do we do that? So in Elira, you go on the tab, which is called the runtime images. So there are images that you can use uh, to run these notebooks. So there are environments that you can use and uh, run uh, on top. You can put this notebook and they will run on this environment. So now you see the importance of having notebooks and dependencies and why uh, you want this environment to be um, basically reproducible. So in this way, you don't break the steps or is very, I mean, it's impossible to break these steps. So let's add the, the runtime images. And now we can go to the spreadsheet and you go to the second sheet that I showed you before. And as you can see, there is a runtime images section. So this section show you the two runtime images that we're gonna use. So you can pick up the first link and we go to Elira and we call this download dataset step image name is this one. You can save it. So this is my first runtime environment, uh, runtime image that I created. And then I will repeat the same for the other step. As you can see, the image that uh, are going to be created by the pipelines, actually something that we already uh, provided for you. And uh, if we go to the second one, second link, let's say that let's take the training one, the image here. Now you have also the training step. 
So why we want to do this? Because Elira re requires to have a specific runtime image for each of the step. It's something that you can configure from here. And what else you can configure is the uh, resources you need for your task and environment variables. If you have some output files and how do you want to call them or um, where you want to store them. And you need to do for each of the steps. So if I have 20 steps, I need to configure these things. And also the, the UI, of course, will say that there are some inputs missing, but you need to do this for each of the step. So just to speed up a bit this part, let's save it, but let's go and, and uh, see the actual pipeline that was created because there are some configuration that were already set for you. So we don't need to do um, to reset them. As you can see, the um, resources are already created. The environment variable are set. The output files are already set. What we need to do is to select the images. So we created the load data set step, runtime image. And we can do the same for the training one because we just added the image. As you can see, there are different uh, resources uh, configured for the different steps. The only thing we need to modify in this case is the environment variables. So this is set to use uh, S3, but uh, for this workshop, we are gonna use Minio. And what you have to insert is the object storage endpoint URL, which is uh, something that you can find in the spreadsheet. So let's copy this and let's go back here and be sure to remove all this part and just paste the URL of menu and object storage name. We can create one and let's call it uh, fconf us We can have a look at menu and we can actually create this for you. US 2021. Yes. Or I already set it here. Yes, it's here. So let me actually create it for all of us. So we have this new bucket here and we need to add it here. So remember to um, make sure that there is no, there are no typos and anything. And now we can basically save it. So what is missing? Uh, so we have the images. We know each of the step, which kind of image a resource requires. Now we need uh, an engine to run this pipeline. How you can do this in uh, Elira? This is also part, of course, of the um, Jupyter book. So as you see, what we did just a moment ago is just to add the random images, the tutorial uh, downloads data step, uh, step, and the training data uh, training step. There is also a CLI if you need to do that. But what we want to do now is to set the engine that is going to run these steps. So what we do, we go here, and there is runtimes. How do we create these runtimes? As you see, Elira allows you two type of engines. And in this case, select Kubeflow pipelines. This is what we're going to use today. Let's call it uh, DevConf US. Um, okay, or engine. Kubeflow pipeline API endpoint. So this is something you find in the runtime section in the spreadsheet. So I'll just take the first link. This is the link to the pipeline on Kubeflow. You can also open the link if you want, and it will basically redirect you to the UI of Kubeflow, and you're going to see that there are uh, already some pipelines that have been uh, created here. And Kubeflow Pipeline Engine, as I said, it can be Argo or Tecton. In our case, we use Tecton. And now we need to set the cloud object storage. 
So the endpoint is always the one for Minio. So you can just take this one and add it here. Object storage name is also here. So you have Minio and sorry, username and password and Minio123. It's a very secure password. Minio, Minio123. I didn't do it. Minio123. Yes and the object storage bucket name, which is the one that we just created for the workshop. So it's DevConf US 2021. But if everyone set everything already, we can just uh, save and close and I will check the steps. So we are all on the same page. So we created the runtime images and we created the runtime for Kubeflow, the AI pipeline, we know how to create it and it's already created it. So let me know if you already have all these uh, three steps and then we can move to actually run this pipeline and we will see what happened. So please um, let me know when you are done or if you have any issues, we are here for any problems. If you have any, any question, please uh, let me know. Related to Elira, related to the object storage or anything that you want to know something more, please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions or the resources. Everything is um, described in any case in the Jupyter book. So you can find anything that we just did described in the Jupyter book. And if you're happy, if you reach this part, I will wait a few minutes. If you have any questions or issues, let me know. So just to repeat what we did, we created the runtime. With all, in, with all the information, if you need to modify anything, you can do it. Remember, we need the Tecton and you need the Kubeflow engine at the beginning. So remember to select Kubeflow when you create the runtime. The other thing we did is to add the runtime images for the steps. This is quite straightforward. As you can see, it's easy just to add the runtime image. And then we basically adjusted the options for the step. Uh, the download data set step is the runtime selected for this and everything is already set. While in the training notebook, remember to adjust these two environment variables to use uh, Minio. And the name of the bucket, just DevConf US 2021. In this case, of course, we use the training step. So I see some of you are there. Um, I don't know about the others. Please uh, let me know if you are stuck somewhere or there is something that we have to do. Don't worry if you miss anything here because uh, these two parts are, um, let's say not linked. We can still continue and we can also finish the part is not a problem. So if you're stuck anywhere, just let me know and uh, we can start or repeat anything here. Okay, I'm sorry, Torsten, I hope uh, <laughs> you solved the connection issues. And uh, please let me know if you have any other problem. Otherwise I would go ahead because it's, we have 40 minutes left, I think. Well, if you have any problems, please uh, let me know. I cannot uh, see your environments or what you're doing, unfortunately. So if you can give me a yes or no, we can move ahead meanwhile. So what we want to do now is to run the pipeline. And uh, as it is described here, 
running the pipelines once we everything is set is quite straightforward you have a play button just call the pipeline as you want i can use my username and runtime platform do you want to use kubeflow and of course is the one we just created devconf us engine once you are ready you can just click the button and with this will say that uh, the pipeline has been submitted to kubeflow so if you go to kubeflow itself and we go to experiments and maybe we reload you see i start to see some of the pipelines so this is the pipeline i just submitted and what we'll do is just repeat the same uh, um, or run the two notebooks that uh, we showed before so it's going to do these two steps but uh, as you can imagine you can do very complex uh, um, structure for uh, for your uh, pipelines so the first one is just downloading the data set the data set and if you go to minio we should see already some of the pipeline as you see uh it's storing everything in the in the object storage so there is the data set the data that we need for the training and the second step is gonna take this um data that are just downloaded and it's gonna train the model and at the end uh, create the model for us so as you can see this is uh again uh all automated i see only two pipelines running for now so if you have a problem francisco there's a question in yes. chat by pat where is it ah here no, the manually maintaining pipelines. Did you answer that um, one? No. Ah, sorry. Yeah, by manually maintaining Second the info about the runtime bottom. images, aren't we breaking the automation chain? Mm. Can you elaborate a bit? Pep, would you, would you like to join us here and uh, maybe explain yes, the question a bit better for Francesco? Hello, Pep. We cannot. Hello, hear you. Pep. And Alman having an issue making the request. Hmm. Not yet. <laughs> so, Alman. I had the same problem in the beginning. For uh, running the pipeline? With the mic. No, no, with okay. the mic. So, Almen. Okay, how about now? I will come. Like, no, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, that's good. Okay, so yeah, I was asking. So, in the steps here, you in the pipeline, you had to go to each of the uh, notebooks and configure manually the specific runtime image that you wanted to run that pipe that notebook on, like one yes. by one. Um, and this means this this is stored in the pipeline configuration, and it will not change. Let's say if if the runtime image is updated um, later at some point, um, how will the pipeline itself get updated? Uh, automatically or do you have to is it, that that's the question is there a, a way to keep this updated automatically the pipeline as well to, to you mean the ai pipeline yeah so currently the ai pipeline i mean in theory i mean you reach a certain st stage of your project so at the moment when you need to release we basically, once the uh, tag is created on Quay, 
the pipeline is able to update automatically the, the tags that are present in the manifest in the repo. So what we want to do is also to automate this uh, thing in the future, because we know already the tag and uh, basically the source of truth is always uh, the GitHub repo. So if we released a new version as I did uh, today, then it means that uh, we need to use in this pipeline the new uh, version of the of the of the image that we just created. Of course, if you modified anything related to the software stacks, in this case or the notebooks, in this case we're not modifying anything, so we are using uh, the version that we know that is working. So we are we know that we are not breaking, of course, the the pipeline, but. Uh, in the future, we might want to also to automate the tag automatically. But in theory, you can the pipeline that we're using right now is using, uh, as you see, version v 0.11. And since then, we didn't modify anything uh, specific to the notebooks or something specific to the to the code. We are just updating documentation, so it's not we are not breaking that. But uh, this is a good point. Actually, it could be a good uh, feature request if you want for automating that. So. Thank you, Pep, for the question. I hope it answered also your <laughs> your yes. question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pep. Uh, Almen, so error compiling pipeline, Elira. OK. I don't know if you can come here, Almen, if you want, or if you want to share the screen, if it's OK for you. I, I mean, this would. Uh, make things a bit easier for us to see what where is the issue. If not, uh, there are a few things I would check. Um, So there few could be a few things that do not work at the moment. So I would check or recheck the runtime if you are adding the correct uh, Kubeflow pipeline API endpoint that you put uh, Tecton because maybe the compilation is really due to maybe you didn't uh, select Tecton. So if you're using Argo, there is, uh, um, we cannot run that at the moment because we are we have only Tecton here. Uh, please uh, check also the, you, uh, the URL for the menu and that password, username, everything is uh, selected accordingly. And let me know if there are any issue here. If there are no issue here, let's um, please let me know more about uh, because I should have a look at uh, what um, you have configured. So meanwhile, if you were able to submit the pipeline. You should have your your pipelines, and I see just two. But uh, basically, here you have the two steps that we just created, and this is what happened. And at the end, we just uh, created a model of uh, for this application. So if we go here, we are basically at this step. We were able to. Run the pipeline. I know some of you were not able. Ah, okay. So I hope it works now, Almen. And if you are able to run it, then now that uh, you have a model, uh, what you typically do is to um, let's say create uh, an image for it and you want to deploy it. As you know, there are different type of deployments for the models. 
And I think we can go to the deployer model. So as you see, this is a tutorial, uh, uh, we want to be quite flexible. So we want to show that uh, there are different tools that can be used. So Seldon, TensorRT, Cave Serving. So there are different type of deployments. For this specific workshop, we are using a simple Flask application. So you, it's, it's also something that you can do. So let's go to the uh, deploy your model as a Flask application in this case. So in order to uh, create the Flask application, we had to create some uh, Flask app. So as you see here in your uh, um, folder, you see that there is this file that states basically what the application is doing the endpoint that we are going to expose. So there is the predict endpoint and the metrics because we want to see what is happening uh, in your model. And the model itself is created, uh, sorry, in this specific repo. As you see, there is everything is uh, um, stored in a specific uh, folder so you can immediately find it. And here is basically loading the model if you want to use um, Ceph. So the model that we uh, it's created on Ceph, or you can just store the one that uh, use the one that is uh, stored locally. As you see, there are models and everything is uh, stored here. So how do we deploy the model? Maybe Tom, you want to step in now. If you want to talk a, a bit about uh, Argo CD and uh, what you did and why we want to use Argo CD. I can leave you the stage or presentation if you want, or if you want me to do the steps while you explain as you prefer. Yeah, maybe you can start doing the steps as 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 I, okay. as I talk. Perfect. So this again um, in the initial presentation, if you remember, uh, I was talking about operate first uh, and. Uh, how we're trying to operate things uh, in the open and uh, automatically and in a way that is basically accessible to anybody and transparent. That means uh, we're using um, we're using tools familiar from the development world uh, and just repurposing them for operations. This is a very big trend currently in, in cloud native uh, com computing word, uh, world uh, operations. And that is uh, using things like customize, uh, YAML manifests, Argo CD, uh, Helm, and other tools that basically facilitates deployment declaratively for you. So Argo CD uh, is a tool that manages application lifecycle for you uh, based on GitOps uh, principles. So you have basically a Git repository uh, where you track your manifests. In your case, this is the LIR repository that you've forked. Uh, so if you go to, uh, I don't know, either GitLab or GitHub uh, of your fork of your repository, you can see a manifest folder uh, in uh, in your repository. And this is where um, this particular repository is storing its deployment manifests and its deployment specifications. So you see uh, Kubernetes uh, resources, uh, entities that can be deployed uh, to a cluster and the cluster will automatically de detect their type and, and act accordingly. And since we have those manifests defined here as a basically as a code, as a software, uh, we can automatically deploy them through Argo CD. So that's what we have our Argo CD instance for. Uh, and you have we, we have this workshop apps repository. So we will be using uh, this repository to create our own application uh, for this workshop purpose. Uh, and then we will later experience how the application gets automatically detected uh, and deployed uh, for your particular fork. So 
Francesco, you can go ahead and maybe uh, comment out on what you're doing currently uh, for your tutorial for, for the demo. Thank, thank you, Tom. So as Tom explained, uh, actually, uh, this repository was created by Tom. And uh, this repository is the one that we're going to use for the next uh, step. So the next step is to fork the workshop up. And actually, yeah, we need to clone it. So what we're going to do is uh, go to the to this specific repo, which is mentioned as always in the data you have here. So I will pass it here. Maybe it's easier. So this is the repo for workshop apps, which is maintained by Argo CD. So go into this link and fork your repo, fork this repo, sorry. And once you have this fork, as always, we know how to do this. Remember at the beginning, I mentioned that the GitHub, GitLab extension can uh, just manage one repository at a time. So now we are gonna see how to do this from the, um, directly from the CLI. So what you can do is just open a terminal and run git clone of your specific fork. Once again, go fork the repo and just take the URL here. And then you can just clone it. Now, as you see, I have also workshop apps. And the only step that is described here is to run a specific uh, um, file that was created for this uh, task. And if we go here, we can also see it. So as you can oh. see, this is a very simple script by script that uh, is creating a manifest resource. This is a kind application which is consumed by Argo CD and Argo CD will deploy an application based on it and reconcile on it. So as you can see in the source repository URL in the manifests, it's, it will basically point to your repository fork and on the one, one line above, there's a path. So it will try to resolve this path and look for uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift manifests in this path. And uh, we are creating just a flat list of applications in the workshops apps repository. Uh, so if you run this script with your GitHub username, as Francesco is doing right now, you get apps dash devconf us uh, 2021 uh, and your application. So this application is an application resource pointing to uh, pointing to a repository. So what will happen when we create a pull request uh, with this resource is that we will run some CI checks on it as we usually do uh, in uh, in operate first, and uh, then we will basically merge this PR and once the PR is merged, Argo CD will pick up this application resource and deploy the application for us. And we do need, don't need to care about anything else than just basically uh, updating. If, if we want to change something within our application, we can just go to our uh, Paco space uh, slash Alira AI DevSecOps tutorial repository and change the manifest there and everything rest, uh, everything else is taken care of by Argo CD and by the cluster itself. So uh, we have automated our application deployment fully uh, with just uh, changing our application manifest in uh, Git repository and nothing else. No other interventions are needed. Thank you, Tom. So as Tom mentioned, we just need to run the script. So once you clone your repo, you can just uh, move to the repository. So you run CD and the name of the folder, and then we can run the script with your specific username. 
And once you're there, you can see with Git status that uh, there are some changes in this uh, specific uh, GitHub reposit Git repository. And uh, this is just to show you what is the content uh, and how it was modified respect to the, um, the content that was there. So then what we do, as we said, as we said before, we move the, we are doing the same uh, changes now. So we move the change, the change to staged. And once this is done, we can do git commit. In this case, we are repeating the same thing. We are adding the message from here. And then in, as you see in this case also, this was never done. So because this is a clean environment that was created. So you need to add this configuration to git. And now we can probably, yes. And then once you're done, you can do git push origin name because the name of the, and as is before, you just enter your, and I need to enter my token. So I will stop a second. Let me take my token. And just so in the meantime, if you are just watching uh, our uh, workshop right now, uh, you can go to this link and there you will be able to see uh, applications popping up uh, for once we basically merge those PR or how to merge those PRs uh, from the workshops apps. Uh, so I see Alman, you're uh, having some issues. Uh, let me check where is all of you. So I hope you were able to do this and to push your changes. I did. So So Almen, don't worry if you want to, I think this environment is still open in any case, right, Tom? Yes. So they, they can still doing this. And uh, if they let us stay here, we can also continue a little bit if uh, it's necessary. Um, so now you see that I pushed. So the same thing that we did before, but uh, with the GitHub extension, now you, we can we did it from the terminal. So you know how to do it in both uh both cases and now i go to my fork and i should see that there are changes and i can just open a pull request this is the manifest that we just created and let's open a pull request so now i open the pull request and someone should approve it and let's see if there are more pull requests or I see that there is there are two pull requests at the moment. So right now uh, we're running some CI checks on the pull request. So if you take a look at the pull request details, uh, you see we're checking uh, customized build, which is not necessary for this particular uh, particular uh, pull request, but we're also checking a pre-commit. Uh, which is validating your manifest against OPA policies and checking if you're trying to deploy something malicious, uh, like something uh, else than Argo CD application and so on. So once this check, uh, once this check passes, uh, we will auto approve this PR and it will get merged. And then we should see the magic, right? Mm -hmm. So okay, the PR needs okay to test.
No, okay. Diego, I can tell you why. Did you install the Kboot, right? And then I guess you were following these other sections, right? So to actually add the bot as collaborator. So this is not something that uh, will be required actually. It's still here, but uh, our team is working and by the end of this week, this uh, requirement is will be no more here because we don't want, uh, I mean, we don't want the user to wait for us and uh, for the bot to be um, accepted. But uh, this will be not, not required anymore. So you can also skip this step. And uh, if you have everything configured for your registry and the rest of the things, this is something that uh, also the issue needs to be enabled if you want to use the bot. And you will see that the bot can open uh, issues for you to see if uh, the dependencies are up to date, if you miss any configuration file and everything related to the dependencies. But this specific step is something that we will actually uh, remove uh, very soon. So don't worry about it. This will not be required anymore. You're welcome. So if... So in the I meantime, guess. CI passed on Francesco's app and I've approved CI on, uh, on the other PR we have here. So there's CI is still running. Uh, now it passed, so it will be auto approved in any minute. Yes. Yes, now it's auto approved and the bots will act upon it. And now, uh, if you refer to your, your page right now, I think you have a stale application in there. Yes. Oh, yes. So I should see appearing my yes. application. And this will sync up automatically, so it will create the application resource. This is what's happening right now. Uh, and when you click on the little button beside, yes, beside the checkbox, you get redirected to your application, uh, which will create all these resources, which were found in your in your repository fork of the uh, Elira AI DevSecOps tutorials. Uh, and that basically means that all these resources gets deployed into OpenShift. So can we see this? Uh, so if you want to see what is happening, you have also the link to OpenShift. So you can just open the link. You will probably need to log in with Operate First as always. And we can go to the namespace, which is called DevConfuS or no, this one, right? Yes. So if you go to pods, you see that all the things that were described uh, here actually now are present here, right? So we have the two deployments. One is for Tom and one is for me. And sorry. Oh, you see that there are two deployments and this is exactly what we find inside the cluster. So as you see, we didn't do much. The part of the deployment is completely automated. What we had to do is just to provide the manifest the first time, but then this is completely automated. And uh, when the manifests are updated, Argo CD will redeploy the, the application. So if we change the tag in your repo, then this will be basically re uh, deployed. So if you go to routes, let me see where is everyone. Or if you're still stuck somewhere, please let me know. Or if you want me to 
Ok, thanks Urvashi, sorry I didn't see the... So we have two applications waiting on the CI. Um, one will be merged very soon and the other is still pending the first TI checks. So okay. let's give it a few minutes. Yes. So basically now that if we did this part, verify that Argo CD did this. Now what we want to do is to um, basically test the application. So we want to test that the uh, deployment is working, that uh, we are able to receive the um, actual predictions. And we also want to have a look at the metrics. So we want to see that uh, everything is working. So actually, yeah, this is something that we already. Now we have one more, one more PR merged. So in our CD, we will see another application popping up. It's already synced <laughs> before I was able to refresh the page on my end. Refresh. Whoa, that's very fast. And so we are able to log in. We can check the deployment is successful. And now we will move to the last part. So you're basically, we're able to deploy now. And I see that also other were able to open pull request. So I guess Diego is next. You see that we have three deployments now. And we see that the deployment of the uh, is almost ready. So let's wait for Diego to be there and then we can move to the last step. Let's see where we are here. So we were deploy your model, Flask application, and we want to test the model. So to test the model, I will just explain uh, some of the things and we we do have a notebook actually, we can go directly here. Maybe it's easier to explain. So if you go here, the notebooks, we're gonna use this notebook now, the test deployed model. So as you see, the first part is just uh, importing some libraries. So you can start and just run it. Then we need some specific, uh, configuration to be done for logging into OpenShift because we want to reach those deployments. And as we are in a different uh, namespace, we cannot, uh, I mean, there is no um, service account or way to talk to the other namespace from here at the moment. So what we do is we're gonna log in and we can basically run the commands. So in order to log in, let me see if uh, Diego was also in now. Oh. Not yet. Okay. But okay, Diego, you can already go there because uh, that is something it that will be on the minute. Yes. Okay. So meanwhile, you open this uh, test deployed model. You go to worker links, and we go to OpenShift API. So we can copy this. You can go to the notebook and change this for. Uh, the API of this cluster. Then we need the token. Where do we take the token? So if you were able to log in, in order to get your token, you can just go here and go to copy login command. You will see my token now, but uh, that's fine. So you can take your token and you can put it. It's not something that you do with others, but uh, the purpose of the workshop is okay. So you are logging in, and as you see, um, yes, 
don't want this. So let's add this here. Remember to add this, the login. And we should log in in a second. I hope. Okay, let me stop and try again. Okay, now it worked. So now we are logged in. We can see in which namespace we are. We're in the default namespace. And now we want to move to the one of the project. So it's called, we can check it here. Project is Elira AI DevSecOps Tutorial. So as the repo. So we go here and we enter Eli, Elira AI DevSecOps Tutorial. And now we want to see the pods. So the same thing that you see here. You can have a look from the CLI of uh, OpenShift. And now we want to get the routes. Each of us have a different route. If you don't want to take it from here, but you can find it here. If, you, if it's easier, you can go to OpenShift and routes, and you see that there are different routes for you. Um, I think, yes, Diego is coming up. So the route will be available as soon as the deployment finishes. But meanwhile, you can, if you want, you can just take one of these and change with your name because it's the only thing that is gonna be different. So you can do like this. And now we should be able to test it, hopefully. So let's close this. Let's see where where is the deployment. Let me log in again. Let's see if Diego finishes. Yes, so the routes should be available right now. Tom? Do you know what happened? Otherwise, Diego, you, you can just take uh, any of the other routes. It will work because we are all able to log in into this project. So you can also copy mine. I can share with all of you. And then we can just try. And there is something wrong. That is great. I think I got this error also the other day. Mm -hmm. But the other were working. Um, if someone tried it, please let me know if for you is working. Meanwhile, I will pass it here so you can find it. Um, point the model. So we can depack it a bit. Response. Okay, this is not good. Something wrong in my uh, deployment. And has anyone tried? Because this might need some extra debugging and time to to have a look. 
But what I wanted to show you also is another thing that is uh, important for your deployments, which is the metrics. So if you have a look, if you take uh, basically the endpoint, as we shown before, the endpoint has, sorry, the this API that we created has two endpoints. And one is for prediction and the other one is for metrics. So if you try to open it and add metrics, yes, metrics. Maybe there is some issue in the I'm not sure why we cannot reach them. If you're talking, I cannot hear you. I think, so let me try again. Right, Tom? I cannot hear you, Tom. You are muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I think this is caused by the uh, service and service selector uh, in in OpenShift uh, because uh, it's it's it does it does not have the GitHub uh, account prefix in the selector. So maybe we can solve it by uh, unifying deployments. Uh, without a prefix, let me try to deploy it. So I've created a service and a route without all the prefixes of your GitHub username. Okay. And now the route should point to all the routes will point basically to this particular service. It's basically what uh, what Pep mentioned. Uh, so if you take a look at uh, this screen right here, all the routes. Uh, are pointing to this service and this service is not existent without deploying it without your name prefix so that's a bit mistake on our end with prefixing the names and the same happens when you go to the service uh, each service has a selector uh, and this selector basically pointed to a uh, non-existent deployment so I think right now it should start working. 
Yes, let me share if I can. Do you see my screen? Yes. So I tried now the route that uh, you show me. Indeed, now it's uh, available first. And if I go to the endpoint metrics, you see that there are metrics. And this one actually will show uh, the version usually, which is the version of the deployment we are having, and also the endpoint that we are basically there are all the metrics for the for Flask. You see, see if uh, there are the endpoint is uh, taking the prediction. And if we go to the notebook now, as you see, I just modified it with the correct route and now it works. So as you see, we always interact with the the DevOps AI DevOps uh, team as well. So also data scientists interact with them. And as you see, it was uh, basically a problem of the route. And now you can get uh, uh, diction. As you see that the in input image was uh, zero and the model predicted that is uh, zero as expected. In uh, you have some metrics also on the latency and the probability that was uh, used. And you can also play it a bit if you want to try with other uh, type of inputs, or if you want to run more, you can go. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, this is the correct one. This is six. It was predicting six. So this is basically all, I think, for the for the workshop. So once you're able to use the route, you can run the test, and we also add a look at the metrics. And that's basically it. So you will be you basically saw how to move from uh, a project from zero, and how we moved everything, or how we work daily in uh, with all these tools, and how we automate most of the things, so we can focus only on specific stuff, and the rest is pretty much automated by all the tooling that we use. So now we can answer all all the questions you have or if you have any trouble with anything or you want to go deep into any of the steps um pep are you using uh, this one they will also add it to the spreadsheet please use this one, if you want to test the model with the notebook. And what you have to do in the notebook, I will just repeat. Um, you just modify the cluster URL with the one that is provided in the spreadsheet. And then you just take your token. This is uh, the one I have. So to take your token, you just go to OpenShift and you get copy login command, you log in, and then the token will be displayed for you. You just do display token. And the only thing that you need to modify later is uh, to make sure that you are in the correct namespace. So if you are not getting this, you can just move with the CLI to the specific project. And then in the test model, you just need to modify this uh, um, URL which is the one that uh, Tom just fixed. So now the endpoint is available. There were some friction between the service and the route, but uh, now it's working. So if you want to test, you can just modify and you can say two and two. You will see that uh, the model is providing you with the predictions. And this is also happening in the metrics. You will see that this is also changing because uh, we are providing, we are using more the endpoint. So any questions or mine is not working, Diego? Oh, yes. Okay, Diego, are you so are you using the this one, right? The one that I pasted, the last one. Are you able to access uh, 
metrics. So you see the same thing that I see here. So Diego, did you add the cluster URL and did you put uh, your own token? Okay. Does it say that you are in the this project? And what else do we need? So it's exactly this one, right? Okay. And yes, I hope, yeah, the first one is always uh, um, something we need to run. Thanks uh, also, Pep. Let me know, Diego, if it uh, works. And Almen, um, if you want to explore this topic, uh, this topic, uh, you mean just the deployment part or in general, all the things we, or Argo CD or what topics uh, you refer to? In the repo, actually, where is it? So in the repo, you have uh, all the steps that we just did. So if you want to repeat, you can always repeat, reuse the same uh, URL, and you can repeat all the thing we did today. And regarding deployment, if you're referring to deployment, we can, if you want, uh, feel free to open an issue and uh, let us know what you want to find more into the tutorial. So also other can benefit from it. So if you want us to add more resources uh, related to, I don't know, Flask uh, or how to make uh, this application or other type of deployments. Okay, that's great, Diego. So Almen, let me know or feel free to just open an issue here and uh, let us know what you want to see more or if you want to have more resources linked to the to the to what to which part actually if you want uh, to the deployment to argo cd or anything more we can improve this tutorial so that would be a great feedback actually are there any other questions um i hope most of you were able to reach the end or at least to work through different parts because we made it in a way that you don't need to depend on the part before so you can learn different uh, sections and we we are not uh, stopped by any of the step previous steps and yeah please let us know if you have any other questions or if you are stuck in any of the steps and you want us to help you or to tell you something more about uh, those specific steps. And yeah, we are here, we can stay here. Or yeah, I would say other five minutes if you are, if you don't have more questions or if you have issue about the tutorial or you want us to improve it or some specific section, please let us know. We're always happy to receive contribution. And the tutorial is open. As you see, everything is uh, run in the open, in the open way. Otherwise, uh, we can only thank you for your patience. And I hope you enjoy the workshop. I know it's not the same experience and when we are all together, but uh, hopefully next time we will be all <laughs> face to face. So if you have uh, more questions, we can also 
get coffee or talk about other things. It will be nice to be in these conferences also to meet new uh, people and uh, see also what you do because we we also interested in uh, what you do in your daily jobs. So I would say thank you. Uh, sorry, you also see some debugging session. So it was awesome. I think uh, Tom Bajek solved it uh, quite quickly. And uh, yeah, if you want to add something more, Vasek or Tom, uh, I hope you had fun. <laughs> Come to hear you again, again Tom. <laughs> yeah, I can just say until Tom unmutes, uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, it was an interesting workshop from the debugging part, uh, definitely. It sparked new conversation in our team about fixing this bug, actually. Good to know. Uh, <laughs> someone want to contribute to it? Good for that. Uh, from my end, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, it was quite pre great pleasure uh, talking to you, uh, presenting to you. Uh, I would love to see you uh, in any of our communities. Uh, please engage with us, engage with the communities. Uh, and we are here uh, for you, for data scientists in the open in open source space. Uh, so uh, I'd love to meet you one day in person. And if not, uh, let's meet online uh, at some GitHub issues or whatnot. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you all. Actually, I think we can share the slide. Maybe we can put them in the repo of the tutorial in the documentation section. I think it's OK. We are it's open, so we can add them there. So if you want to read the documentation and uh, the slides, we will put them in the, docu in the docs, actually, of the repo. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasek and Tom. It was a pleasure and honor to do it again with you. And uh, otherwise, we will see soon, hopefully. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Tom. Bye, Vasek. Bye. Bye-bye.